in the direction of Eddie Pittman. Both Jeremiah and Zelfia were missing, and investigators learned that these two had witnessed an arson incident, which they considered a lead, and it could be a possible motive. Well, that'd be a pretty good motive, I guess. Attention shifts to Eddie Pittman. Now, the story is that Jeremiah and Zelfia pulled up to this trailer where Eddie Pittman was staying with his girlfriend, a woman named Rosemary Gehring. They drive up. He comes outside and tells them, y'all need to get the hell out of here. Leave. Oh, God. And he's a pretty intimidating guy. So Jeremiah and Zelfia leave the residence. And not very long after, it goes up in flames. So it sounds like he already had the damn whatever he was using to set it on fire set up and it's about to go and he's yeah. like get the hell out he of here now. burned down his girlfriend's trailer. They had planned to do this to collect insurance money. Oh my god. And so Jeremiah and Zelfia were witnesses to this. They had kept it very quiet and didn't tell anybody. But maybe a, like a family member or two but you know it was like it had, nothing had really come of this. Right. It was in February of 1996 that Rosemary Gehring, again the girlfriend of Eddie Pittman, randomly just shows up at the sheriff's department stating that Eddie's going to kill her, she needs protection, she needs help, and it's because of what she knows. Well, investigators are interested. She takes them to a remote area, tells them, you guys need to dig here. Oh, God. Now, the property was once a gem mine, like mostly for rubies. Eddie had been using the dirt from this mine for a tourist gem mining business. Okay. Investigators start digging at this property, and it's, a, it's taking a while. They're digging deep and deeper and deeper, and they're not finding anything. So they're kind of getting a little aggravated with this woman, and they think she's full just of full it. of shit, basically. Okay. And she's like, no, I'm telling you, it's right here. It's down there deep. You need to keep digging. Well, eventually, they find bones. Jeremiah Pittman's remains were found exactly where Rosemary had directed them to dig. Well, damn. Gehring confesses to witnessing a confrontation between Eddie and his son. Now, at some point during this heated argument, Eddie Pittman picked up a hammer, hit his son with it, killing the 18-year-old. The couple then takes Jeremiah's truck and they park it off the interstate to appear as though he's abandoned it. Then the couple takes Jeremiah's body to this ruby mine that they had leased. They dig this grave, toss in the boy's body, and cover him with lime. The cause of death is a blunt force injury, which was the same way that Zofia was killed. Well, my God, maybe if the cops had swung around there and had a conversation with Eddie and got a chance to talk to the damn girlfriend, and really give them a hard line of questioning about Jeremiah's where he's at, or has anything happened to him, they might have figured all this out then. Investigators believe these two murders are tied together, but now, you know, finding evidence is the crucial part. Eddie is arrested for the murder of his son, and when he served with the warrant, he asked, who's murder? <laughs> when they tell him we've got this warrant for murder, we're going to arrest you, and he asks, who's murder? That really sends investigators into a frenzy because they think he means Zelfia. Yeah, which one? Yeah, which, which murder are you talking about here? However, Eddie Pittman does not confess. He says he doesn't know anything about Zelfia's murder. With no evidence tying him to the woman's disappearance, he can't be charged in her death. Eddie Pittman ends up taking a plea deal for manslaughter in the murder of his son, Jeremiah. And as far as I know, the guy's already out of prison. What the fuck? Yeah. I know it's all about evidence, what they can prove in court and all that. During this time, Pittman is also tied to the 1991 murder of Wallace Wise, a 70-year-old businessman from Asheville. Wise sold antiques out of his home and was a real estate agent. He was found stabbed in an upstairs bedroom at his residence on Haywood Road in Asheville. Now, Gehrig had met Wise at some sort of antiques auction, and so they were friends. They were friendly with each other. When Wise's body was discovered by a different friend, there was an antique jewelry box missing, some jewels gone, cash taken. There was no sign of forced entry into the home, 
again because Rosemary Gehrig is friendly with this guy. So basically they went to this man's house. She managed to get in the house. You know, she's an acquaintance. They rob him, kill him. She's officially charged with Wise's murder. And I believe that Hitman is basically just charged as an accessory to this crime. Oh, okay. In November of 1998, another man is arrested in connection with Zulfia's murder. His name is Scott Grady Smith. He was arrested and charged with aiding and abetting. But no arrest was made as far as the actual killer. This part's really bungled. Smith was charged with being present during the murder and assisting in disposing of her body. Investigators believe Zofia was murdered to cover up another crime, but at the time of Smith's arrest, investigators with the McDowell County Sheriff's Department wouldn't release any information on what this supposed crime connection was. Like yeah. what crime was being committed that she witnessed that she ends up dead? Yeah, they only have their theory together. The charges are dropped because it's impossible to prove someone aided in a murder when the actual murderer has not been charged. Okay, now they can't charge that man again with that. And just totally, what like I said, gold bots. Again, ah. these are just people who don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. Damn it, McDowell I mean, I hate County. I to say it, but fuck, get it together. Over the years, time proves to be the biggest enemy in cold cases, as we know. Uh, with Zulfia's case, there seemed to be less and less chance of solving it. People forget details, descriptions, clues, slip through the cracks. You didn't really have a good, solid initial investigation. Uh, yeah, you don't, you can't, yeah, because you so can't lean on that. So it's hard to go back 10, 5, 10, 15 years later and try to question people that have forgotten. It's not fresh in their mind. You didn't interview them 20 years ago. Right. They may have dates confused, memories confused. People die, people move away. That's just, I mean, that. To not have a solid original case file to work, I mean, you, you literally have nothing to work with. Now, as much as I am like, what the hell, McDowell County Sheriff's Department, there is one detective that we should give a round of applause to, a it's guy named Dan Cook. These badass, grizzled investigators. All it takes is one person who is interested in going the extra mile yep. or, you know, just doing their fucking job. To make a difference. So after two years, um, this is after Zelfia's remains were found, you know, two years later, Detective Dan Cook with the McDowell Sheriff's Department begins sort of periodically reviewing the case file, just hoping that something will jump out at him. Around the time Smith's charges were dropped in 1998, Detective Cook found two names written on a small piece of paper that were just sort of stuffed in the case file. The name was Robin Witted and Robert. So didn't even have a last name. Now, Witted has been a possible suspect, but the initial investigation had paid little attention or done much following up with this man. Like someone had given this name, it had been written down, but you know, he wasn't interviewed, no one had talked to him. Jeez, yeah. It's just fucked up. Oh right? my god. The names were given by an informant too, and this may be another reason why it was partially dismissed. Yeah, they weren't believing them or think they're full of shit. This informant's name is Ronald. That's all I know. That's a lot of R's. He claimed he had known neighbors of Witted who had described this one particular evening when Zelfia had gone missing and how his friend had gone over to ask Robin Witted and this guy Robert to turn music down. They all lived in a trailer park together. The two men at this time acted pretty strangely, and they were later seen carrying something out of the house. Like, they thought maybe it was a rolled-up rug or piece of carpet. Denise Coleman is the neighbor. She confronted the men about the music because she explained that, you know, she was basically getting high on meth. And she didn't want the cops up there, so you gotta turn your music down because we're at my house getting fucked up and we don't need cops up here. Okay, that's reasonable, besides doing the math. <laughs> <laughs> she says that, you know, when she goes to confront them about the music, this guy Robin said they had picked up a girl from a truck stop, Zelfia Lowry, that they had sex with her, and that she was in the house throwing up, that 
the guy Robert was in there trying to clean up this mess. So yeah. he's just like telling her the story that's probably a little bit too much information. She's high as fuck, so you know. And then later she says she sees these men carrying out what looked like a rolled up rug out of the house. That's almost like a cliche. <laughs> Isn't it? Well, I'm just imagining, you know, I go knock on the neighbor's door and I'm just like, do you mind turning your music down? Yeah. And then they start telling me a story about, well, we just picked up this girl, this truck stop and we're in here, we're in here banging her, but she threw up and some of my buddies in there cleaning up the puke. I mean, isn't that just like a little bit too much to offer up? Yeah. But then again, maybe not. I don't know because she's telling them y'all need to turn the music down because I'm getting high on meth. Try to smoke my meth over here. <laughs> okay. Anyway, <laughs> enough Jerry Springer. Detectives track down this mobile home. And now you got to remember, this is years later. Ronald's description was actually pretty spot on about where the trailer was located. What it looked like. The trailer park. Yeah, everything. Okay. A landlord even confirms the names of these two men who lived there. Yes, this guy Robin Whitted lived here and he had this other fellow named Robert living in this trailer. Well, by 2005, that's how long it took Detective Cook to track down Robin Whitted. That's crazy. He was living in Virginia. Whitted was working at a car dealership. Now, he admitted he had partied with this blonde girl who had a really unusual name. He couldn't remember her name. He said, you know, he did recall hanging out with her, having sex with her, and then she left the next morning. Cook interviewed Whitted several times. Now, during these interviews, he began giving conflicting stories, which was a huge red flag for investigators. I mean, anytime a person of interest starts switching up their story, this is never a good sign. No, it's because you're fucking lying. Well, in some ways, you got to think, okay, well, if something happened 20 years ago and someone asked you about it, your details might be a little foggy. There might be something that you remember later. Like, right. oh, well, yeah, this Small, or that. Small, minor details. But... Your story as a whole is not going to change. No. Drastically. No, minor stuff may change, but not the complete, not the timeline or not the what you did or who you did it with. That's so not going to change. After a few interviews, eventually Whitted is going to crack under pressure. He admits he was involved in the cover up of Lowry's murder, but he claims he was not the actual killer and he pins the crime on his friends. So let's talk about this guy, Robert Dean Taylor. His name is Bobby. People call him Bobby. Oh, of course they do. He had been staying with Witted back in 1993. The pair had known one another from childhood, like they were elementary school friends. Witted happened to be visiting his family in Virginia when he bumped into Bobby Taylor. He invited Taylor to come back to North Carolina with him. See, Witted was recently separated from his wife, and I guess he thought having his childhood buddy around would be good for him. They were going to party, chase women, drink, hang out, just right. live it up. Yeah. Two bachelors. In this really nice trailer. We're going to party. It's 1993. We're going to throw on some winger, some rat on the stereo system. And <laughs> uh, we're going to do a little dance, make a little love, right? Maybe with each other. I don't know. I don't judge. Taylor moved into Witted's rented mobile home and eventually did find work, you know, in the Marion area. On July 27th, 1993, Witted claimed he had come home from work around 4.30 p.m. Taylor was waiting for him at their residence, and he had a copy of Lowry's phone number. Bobby Taylor wanted to call her and invite Zelfia over, you know, just to party and hang out. Now, it wasn't ever really clear how Bobby Taylor had gotten her phone number. Okay. Like if it was from someone he worked with or he had maybe seen her and then asked someone else who is she and gotten her number. I mean, I don't know. But the pair, meaning Zelfia and Bobby Taylor, had never actually met each other in person. So they had only ever spoken on the phone. So he didn't, hey girl, what's your name? No. How you going? So, I mean, maybe it was get them digits. like a friend had sort okay. of set them up. That's a little weird. Or but... maybe he had called someone else and had gotten on the phone with her at some point. I mean, who okay. knows? Back in the day before we had Tinder and Facebook and huh. texting and all that. Hey, you got to hook up somehow. <laughs> well, Witten and Taylor 
they decide they're going to get in touch with Zelfia. They call her up. 